SpaceX Starlink satellites were lost due to a Falcon 9 RUD or rapid unscheduled disassembly. What the heck happened? Let's talk about it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time. Today we have a little bit of fireside. That's smokiness. I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee, hanging out, talking tech, talking photo, talking video. Today is a technology space Starlink SpaceX day. <laughs> well, a rud occurred, a rapid unscheduled disassembly of a Falcon 9 rocket. This has not happened in a while. I was reading some articles over on Benzinga, over on Space News and Space.com and just all over the place. And they did a really good job at kind of putting things together. I guess the superficial, like what happened. I want to dig in a little bit deeper because this channel has always been about the why behind things. So I want to know why this happened. So we're going to look at some of the factors that possibly caused this explosion or this failure and possible loss of all 20 satellites. Sometimes this does take a little bit longer and I hope you understand. So we're going to get into this article first and then of course I'm going to give you my commentary on it and why I think this happened and more importantly the effect. What will be the fallout from this failure of the Falcon 9? Because there will be a bit of fallout. And we'll get into that before the end of this video. So before we get into the article, I want to say that if you enjoy this video, even in the least, throw it a thumbs up. That will be very helpful for myself, for the channel, for growing the channel. I would appreciate it. If you're not subscribed, consider doing so. If you are, thank you. I appreciate that. Click this little notification button over here. So when I go live or when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. Matter of fact, tonight we'll be live on the JC Live show. So definitely be there. 8.30 p.m. usually, Eastern Standard Time. Be there or be square. That's corny. I'll edit that out. Maybe not. If you enjoyed the content and you just want to say thank you for all of my hard work, you can just click down here. There's a little thank you button. You could give a dollar or two. That would be great. If not, that's perfectly fine. You'll still get the video for free. And if you want more Starlink content, I have over 300 videos just for you. Don't click this little button over here just yet. But after watching this video, click over here, take a look at my Starlink playlist. You'll see a bunch of helpful how-tos, tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what to buy, how to use it, and the why behind everything. Once again, this channel is always about the why. So let's jump right into this article. And then once again, I'll give you my commentary. And more importantly, I want to hear from you down in the comment area below. Elon Musk, SpaceX on Friday, said the company couldn't deploy Starlink satellites into their intended orbit on Thursday due to an issue with the Falcon 9 rocket's second stage engine. 20 Starlink satellites were deployed into a lower than intended orbit, the company said on a post on X. Now, as a side note here, out of the 20 that were supposed to be placed into orbit, 13 of those were the DTS variants, which is that direct to satellite. So 13 of them had those E node Bs built into them, which basically transmutes <laughs> the satellite into a cell tower at 540, 550 kilometers above Earth, which is an amazing feat, but that's what it does. So once again, 13 of them were those DTS variants. Now, the article continues with, the company is unaware of the reason for the engine issue and is reviewing the data to understand the root cause. Now, Elon Musk on a post on X, he said this, Upper stage restart to raise perigee resulted in an engine rud for reasons currently unknown. Team is reviewing data tonight to understand root cause. Starlink satellites were deployed, but the perigee may be too low for them to raise orbit. We'll know more in a few hours. This is very interesting. He came immediately. And that's one thing that's really cool about Elon Musk. It doesn't matter if something good happens or bad happens. He immediately goes to X with it and he tells you what's going on. I appreciate that. The article finalizes with this. The Falcon 9 was carrying 20 Starlink satellites. SpaceX has made contact with five of them so far and is attempting to raise their orbits using their ion thrusters. 
Elon Musk came once again with a update on X. This was about an hour and 10 minutes later, not two hours later, which is nice. He said this, we're updating the satellite software to run the ion thrusters at their equivalent of warp nine. That's a Star Trek reference for sure. There you go. Unlike a Star Trek episode, this will probably not work, but it's worth a shot. The satellite thrusters need to raise orbit faster than atmospheric drag pulls them down or they will burn up. So what caused the explosion and more importantly, why does it matter? So I wanna get into this a little bit because I think that it's very interesting. I hope you do too. The cause of the explosion, obviously they're researching it. They're going over the data internally right now. I am not working for SpaceX, so I don't know, but we're gonna do some speculating here, just using some common sense and see if we could come up with something. And if I'm wrong, that's great. If I'm right, that's great too. If you have any ideas, let me know in the comments, right? I think that that's very important. Now. Everything was going fine during the initial launch. Everything was nominal on up to about three minutes. And the craft was just under a hundred kilometers when they released the fairing. And now the Starlink satellites are exposed. That's right around three minutes. Everything is going well. Well, we could see that purge bag. Now that purge bag or insulation blanket, they call it that wrap. It looks like aluminum foil that goes above the Merlin engine. Well, we could see that it started filling up with something. Now what it filled up with, we don't know, but ice started forming on the outside. Now every once in a while during a launch, you'll see ice chunks kind of fall off, but it was a little bit more than that. <laughs> and as you can see in the video, it gets kind of crazy. By five minutes down, well, now there's large amounts of ice forming around the shadow side of the vehicle. Now on the sunlit side of the craft, we could see more of a dripping. So there's ice forming, but we could also see dripping where there's actually liquid kind of pouring out, which probably isn't very good, is it? <laughs> not, not very good. Now I was thinking about this. What liquid would be pouring out of the vehicle? Well, there's only three liquids that are there at any given time. Number one, there's one called a T-TEB. T-TEB is what they call it. Now it's a long name, matter of fact, I'll put, pop it up on the screen here or whatever. I'm not gonna try to read it. Anyways, that is an oxidizer, okay? The way that works is that they use that T-TEB as an oxidizer to immediately or spontaneously combust when it meets liquid oxygen. So they use the T-TEB liquid as an oxidizer, once again, to cause the combustion of the liquid oxygen. It is a hypergolic ignition. Now the question is, is there any of this T-TEB left on the second stage for reignition? And my understanding is no, there isn't. I also did some research on this T-TEB to see if it is combustible. Like if you threw this into a flame, will it ignite? And the answer is no. Once again, it is an oxidizer. The only way it ignites is when it is combined with the liquid oxygen and it spontaneously ignites. So we have the T-TEB, that's not leaking out because it's not there, number one, and even if it was, it wouldn't be blowing up. So what do we have left? We have LOX or liquid oxygen and we have RP1. RP1 is basically kerosene. So what's leaking out? Is it the kerosene or is it the liquid oxygen? Well, when I looked at this, I'm like, huh, this is kind of interesting because it is freezing up, right? As it's coming out, it's freezing. Well, liquid oxygen, yep, yeah, that would freeze, all right? But kerosene really doesn't freeze at the temperature that the vehicle was at. Now, Space at around, let's say 100, 130 kilometers is what it was at. It's around what, negative 50 Fahrenheit or something. Now, if you go into deep space, he'll get down to like negative 450 degrees Fahrenheit. But on the sunlit side of the planet where the rocket was and at that specific altitude, it was probably, let's say negative 40, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So kerosene would not be freezing. So what is left? LOX, right? Liquid oxygen is freezing. Now, when we watch the video, we can see that chunks of ice that are falling off and that are entering that flame were immediately exploding, right? 
So I would have to say that what was coming out of the craft was liquid oxygen. Now, would that cause the explosion? Not really. Also, if you were to take kerosene and mix it with liquid oxygen and form, let's say, a ball of ice, and you threw it into a, a fire, would it ignite? And the answer is really no. So thinking about it, the only way for it to really have exploded is if there was a catastrophic failure within the engine itself, or if the liquid oxygen and the kerosene was to mix together in a liquid form and then ignite, yeah, that's explosive. Well, why would this have happened to begin with? Well, you could have seal failure. There could be some type of seal that failed and now all of a sudden there's a leak. There could be some type of catastrophic failure in a part, in a item that cracked, let's say, and now it was leaking out of a crack. We saw that this bag was filling with liquid. So obviously there's a crack or some type of seal that has burst. There's something going on here where it is filling with this propellant. Now, once again, is it a combination of kerosene and liquid oxygen, or is it one or the other? I really don't know. But I can say one thing, is when I was watching this, I noticed that the craft got up to 158 kilometers. It was at 158 kilometers and 155, 152, 140s, 138. By about eight minutes and 40 seconds into its journey, Rudd occurred. A rapid, unscheduled disassembly. Basically, boom. Now, I was thinking about this for a minute. I said, you know, there's two options here on why it exploded, right? Or how it exploded. Option number one is that the FTS or the flight termination system was used. The reason I say that is because, or I give this option, is because the satellites were released. Now, the satellites were released right around, let's say 140 kilometers. Let's call it 140. Normally the satellites will be released at 340 kilometers, but they were released at about 140. So there's once again, two options here. The satellites were released at let's say 140 kilometers, maybe 145 kilometers. They waited a few seconds or maybe a half a minute and then detonated the vehicle at 138 kilometers. Because that's when we saw at eight minutes and 40 seconds, all telemetry stopped. That was the end of it. The second option was SpaceX was clairvoyant and they knew that the vehicle was going to detonate itself soon and they decided to launch the Starlink satellites at that 140, 145 kilometers, and then it just blew itself up. I think that that's a little bit less likely because I think SpaceX would have had it continue or try to continue to that magic 340 kilometers and not 140. Now, the problem here is, is that 140 kilometers is just too low. All right. If any of these survive, I will really be just floored because ion propulsion is like the difference between a gale force wind and uh, just a slow breeze. <laughs> OK, there is not a lot of thrust to these engines. Now, in zero gravity, there's plenty. Right. But at 140 kilometers, you not only still are feeling some effects of gravity, but you're also getting, uh, let's say, drag, right? Atmospheric drag. And that drag is going to cause it to be pulled back into our atmosphere and burn up. So the thing here is that those ion drives at max, or as Elon calls it, warp nine, would have to fight atmospheric drag and gravity to a degree above the atmospheric drag and gravity. So let's say if the combination of the two was a 10, if those ion engines were able to force the satellites up at an 11, well, it'll get to its destination, maybe in a long while, but eventually it will get there because it was able to fight 
All right, once again, gravity and atmospheric drag. But if they were only to apply, let's say nine out of 10 or less, once again, they're going to be dragged into the atmosphere and then disintegrate. In my personal opinion, I think that this is a complete loss. I think the Falcon 9, of course, was a loss because that rud occurred either through their FTS system or it just naturally blew up. Um, but I also think that all of those 20 satellites will be lost. I don't think that the ion engines will be able to get it to the magical 530 kilometers, 550 kilometers into space when they're sitting at 140. I just don't think that it's gonna happen. That's my personal opinion. Now, the question is, why does it matter? And I think this is very important. The reason this matters is because the Falcon 9 is one of those tried and true rockets that everyone uses, that everyone relies on. Matter of fact, last week, I thought that Elon Musk and SpaceX were gonna get tapped on the shoulder and be like, hey, can you guys put together a rescue mission for this Boeing Starliner? You know, they're leaking and they probably need some help, but they didn't ask them as of yet. But once again, this rud that occurred, this rapid unscheduled disassembly, puts a little bit of a darker shadow on the Falcon 9. Now, the last time a Falcon 9 actually failed like this was back in 2015. So you're looking at about 10 years ago. But once again, these agencies and these companies want a 99.9% .9 track record. They don't want to see any explosions, especially if something happens and there was actually a manned craft that went up there and not just Starlink satellites. So these are my thoughts. Digging in a little bit deeper, this is what I've come up with. I could be wrong, who knows? Once again, I'm not a rocket engineer or a, some type of scientist, and I don't work for SpaceX. I wanna hear from you. What are your thoughts? What do you think happened here? Do you think that it's going to matter? Will it kind of cast a shadow on the Falcon 9? Um, or will it not? Once again, it has had an amazing track record for 10 years, but it's always what you've done lately and not what you've done in the past is what people look at, right? Which sometimes is good and sometimes is bad, in my personal opinion. Anyways, guys, if you enjoyed this video, like I said before, throw it a thumbs up. That'll be very helpful. Don't forget to subscribe if you're not. If you are, thank you. Finally, head over to my website, jchristina.com, where you can find all the photography tools I've invented for you, as well as my merch, my tees, my books, my shirts, and all the rest of this stuff. Pick something up. Help support me and my family. Many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, and we'll see you in the next one. Love you all. Bye.